Welcome to Speak for Yourself from the Crib, presented by Hyundai. Happy day before Friday. Jason Whitlock, Marcellus Wiley. Fantastic show plan for you today. We're going to pull up in Atlanta and talk to Brian Cox, the former Miami mm. Dolphin, New England Patriot, New York Jet, three-time Pro Bowler, Super Bowl champion. Brian Cox is going to join us in the next segment. We're also going to have the most fearless discussion of the day. We're going to go back in on Patriots kicker Justin Rohwasser, whose former uh, Marshall teammates, a couple of black teammates, have come out and defended him. We'll see if that ends the controversy. Uh, but we'll start by pulling up at T.J. Huchmanzada's crib. T.J., welcome back hey, to hey. Speak for Yourself from the Crib. And we're going to talk about Cam Newton, uh, Gus Malzahn, the head coach of the Auburn Tigers, Cam's offensive coordinator when Cam was a superstar at Auburn and won the Heisman Trophy and led Auburn to a national championship. Gus Malzahn has some interesting comments and perhaps a, a message of warning and inspiration to NFL teams saying this about Cam Newton. I've seen that look before. He's got something to prove. He's determined whoever gets him better buckle up. That's Gus Malzahn, head coach at Auburn, Cam's former offensive coordinator at Auburn when he won a national championship and Heisman Trophy. And I remember that season well. Cam Newton was motivated. He was focused. There was a lot of heat on him from the media, and it brought out the best in Cam Newton. There were all those people that Cam's father took a payoff, and Cam Newton's a bad kid, and he, he did something bad at Florida, and they ran him out of there. And that did focus and inspire Cam to one of the greatest seasons we've ever seen in college football. Gus Malzahn predicting we may see that again in the NFL. Uh, but the question is, and we'll start with you, Marcellus, can Cam Newton be super Cam again? Do you buy what Gus Malzahn is selling here? Absolutely, he will be super cam again. Um, and it's not for the reasons that Gus Malzahn is speaking of, seeing that look before, that look in his eyes. I usually like my syrup with less, my pancakes with less syrup on it when it comes to, like, this whole conversation of complexion. You're motivated because look at him. That's not how the game goes. It's not based on his social media. It's not based on the look and the eye of the tiger. It's not based on what a former coach even says about Cam Newton. The thing that we all need to bank on is the fact that Cam Newton responds to adversity well. Look at his history. This is a guy who's always risen from the ashes. If you go back to his scam and the incident that happened at Florida with the computers and have to go to a junior college and succeed in there, one year at Auburn, one year to go out there and win the national championship, Heisman, first overall pick, Cam Newton, car accident, whatever you want to call it, Cam Newton responds well to adversity. So before we get caught up in the complexion of how it looks and what Cam Newton is doing, how about we just know who Cam Newton is? Somebody that if you're knocked down, you better run because he's going to get up and he's coming back for you. So I believe in Super Cam once again. Man, I, I like what you're saying, but it just takes me. I'm going to give you a date, March 23rd. March 23rd was when uh, Ron Rivera, the only head coach that Cam Newton has known, Traded for Kyle Allen. Oh, and then March 24th, Cam Newton was released. So you don't think in that call, in the process of trying to trade for Kyle Allen, you, they didn't say, hey, we're going to release Cam tomorrow. You want to trade for him? The fact that the only head coach that Cam Newton has had didn't want him, and you have a rookie quarterback in Dwayne Haskins who hasn't proven himself, that gives me calls to pause. Yeah, Cam looks the part. But he's going to have to be the part in the fact that Ron Rivera, in essence, just basically said no. That, that concerns me. You, we all have it here, but actually going out there and doing it is a different thing. And the fact that Ron Rivera isn't interested, that kind of slows me down. And I believe that's why everybody else is slowed down. And ah, do we really want Cam? His only head coach didn't want him. I think the other element to this, again, is Cam's age at age 30. Look, I used to respond well to adversity in my 20s. I used to be able to go out, tie one on, and rebound the next day and come back like nothing ever happened. The reason why I'm such a boring person now is because if I tie one on, it takes me two or three days, if not two or three weeks, to recover. And so Cam Newton in <laughs> NFL years at age 30, given his injuries, he does have a great history of responding to adversity. 
But adversity at age 30, when you've had shoulder surgery, you've had this foot injury, your confidence has taken a beating uh, from around the league and just your peers and just what TJ's saying, you're the only head coach you ever known has no interest in bringing you to the Washington Redskins and trying to win right now. I just think the adversity, if Cam were 25, I'd be right there with Gus Malzahn. But Cam at 30, and with his injury history, and the way this league is, has moved, uh, and, and I'm just, <laughs> I think Cam will initially do well wherever he lands, lands. But can he still run a marathon, the 16-game schedule? I'm not so sure. I think that's unfair to Cam. Uh, one, if you're 30 at quarterback, you're really like 23 at other positions. Like, quarterbacks play into their early 40s, mid 40s. We'll see what Tom Brady does. And speaking of Tom Brady, who tore his leg off the bone, it felt like the ACL reconstructive surgery at the age of 31. Not a single conversation about, oh, he can't return back to form older than Cam Newton at that time, and still immobile as he is now, as he was then, but not a conversation he can't get back to who he was. And in terms of what TJ is saying about what happened in Washington, you got to understand, one, if you're getting on a new job, <laughs> you're not going to make critical demands. You're not going to make extreme demands in that moment. You're just happy to get your job in that situation. Two, ownership has invested in Dwayne Haskins, whatever you think of him. So it's going to be hard to insert a Cam Newton to take over a position where you just drafted highly at that same position and you don't know if the guy has the goods. The jury's still out. So I think it was just an impossible situation, not an indictment on Cam Newton so much that Ron Rivera didn't take him. It's just the conditions and circumstances he had to deal with. Cam Newton has given us no evidence that he would ever slow down. As a matter of fact, when he had his new offensive coordinator with North Turner, people were saying, uh-oh, that's the end of Cam because he's going to have to play a run-heavy control style of ball and he's not going to be accurate enough. And Cam went out there and threw his highest completion percentage of his career before injury MVP conversation. I'm just saying, I don't have any evidence that Cam Newton doesn't respond. I don't know where the conversation comes from that he won't respond. When you look, you look at the teams that Cam could possibly go to on Fox Bay, it's the Jags, it's the Patriots, it's the Redskins, it's the Steelers. Obviously, Cam wants to be a starter. Let's say, for instance, he goes to Jacksonville. Is he going to become Super Cam? Losing franchise, they don't have the weapons around him. So you need everything to align for him to become what he once was. And the teams that could possibly use him they don't have that. The Patriots, you would assume, would Belichick would bring the best out of them. They don't seem like they have any interest in signing him. And so you look at the teams that he can go to, regardless if he's super calm or not, he has nothing around him to help him. So in essence, it's going to look like Cam Newton can't play. And so that, that's the thing when you're in this situation. The good teams don't want or need you, and the bad teams can't help you. Well, the other thing we got to remember is just who Super Cam was. Super Cam could leap tall buildings with a single bound. Su uh, Super Cam could run through NFL defenses and take on linebackers and safeties. And, and so that's why it's just not analogous to Tom Brady. He's immobile. He plays from the pocket. He's not trying to run through the, uh, the jungle of a defense and survive and act like he's a lion just like a Ray Lewis or some of these other guys. Super Cam could do it all. Super Cam can't come back at, at age 30 with his injury history. If he wants to run through uh, and do what uh, Lamar Jackson's doing right now, he, he can't do it. And that, that's the problem. That's why I don't think we're going to see a return of Super Cam because I look at his workouts and he wants to do what Lamar Jackson's doing. I don't think he can do it. All right, we got to move on. We're going to go out to Atlanta and join one of the greatest linebackers, one of the greatest personalities in NFL history. Brian Cox, from his mm. crib, Speak for Yourself, presented by Hyundai, more after this. Welcome back to Speak for Yourself. Today's big story is sponsored by KFC's $20 fill-up, drive throughs open, or get delivery by Grubhub. Mmm. Use some KFC. All right, welcome back to Speak for Yourself. 
<laughs> Welcome back to Speak for Yourself from the Crib. Jason Whitlock, Marcellus Wiley. Time to pull up. Time to pull up at Brian Cox's crib right outside Atlanta. Cox, the former mm. New England Patriot, former Miami Dolphin, uh, former New York Jet, and his son plays for the Buffalo Bills. So that makes Brian the perfect person to ask. With Tom Brady leaving the AFC East and Bill Belichick going solo, perhaps with Jared Stidham. All right, Brian, you're the expert. Who wins the AFC East this season? The New England Patriots, of course. (laughs) In my Mm. opinion, you know, it's easy to say Buffalo is coming along nicely. They've, They've had a good draft. They had a good season last year. Their quarterback's starting to play well. But until you dethrone the champs, you still have to go with the champs. No, I'm going with the Buffalo Bills. Uh, my former team, you can just see them on the rise. Six wins a couple of years ago, then 10 wins last year. They got the right coaching staff. They're drafting well. Great personnel additions to that personnel outside of your son, but Stephon Diggs, even Josh Norman, just to help out in the secondary to a top three defense in the league that now has more weapons offensively and an emerging quarterback. And remember, as a collective, this is a team that was up 16-0 to in the playoffs against Houston and let that game slip away. That bitter taste in their collective mouth, oh, they're going to come back on fire on top of the talent that they have. It's the Buffalo Bills winning. I, the only reason I'm going to disagree with you, uh, Marcel, is because I'm not sold on Josh Allen. And I know they've added Stephon Diggs, really? but Josh Allen's not accurate enough for me. I tend to agree with Brian that it's New England until they get knocked off. But just to be a little bit sexy here, my sleeper pick, the team that I think is actually going to have a chance, is the Miami Dolphins. I really like what Brian Flores Mm -hmm. did last season. People thought they were tanking. And then you go look over the last eight games of the season. That team played really hard for him, and they won some games. I love the addition to Tua Tungwaiola. I like Ryan Fitzpatrick starting out the season. I, I love the offseason moves they've made in terms of not the draft, but also uh, signing the corner, Byron Jones. I, I like the Miami Dolphins as a sleeper team. And for Brian Flores to step out here and maybe shock some people and be the real competitor to the New England Patriots. Well, I, I would just say this. You know, I like what Miami has done. Um, but they were so far behind. I think they're still playing catch up. Really, legitimately, You got New England and you got Buffalo. How many times has Buffalo beaten New England in the last two years? They haven't. So Uh, when you look at it, when when you look at it, they're still playing catch up. So they haven't beaten them. You know, they they closed the gap. They played better, but to dethrone the champs, you got to beat the champs. And I'll just say this: everybody's sleeping on the fact that. You know, the Patriots stay pat with with Stidham. You have to believe that Belichick, in his DNA, has prepared for Tom Brady moving on for some four or five years now. He must be really comfortable with Stidham to not pull the trigger, to move up in the draft to take a quarterback, to be in a situation where you bring Brian Hoyer back to be your backup. They don't take on veteran guys. They stay in a position or a situation where they stay the course. All right, listen, let's move on and let's stick with the New England Patriots and let's stick with that topic of their quarterback situation. Andy Dalton released today uh, by the Cincinnati Bengals. There were rumors Mm. early on in the offseason that the New England Patriots would be a landing spot perhaps for Andy Dalton. Uh, Maybe the Bengals tried to trade him, and that's why they're just now releasing him uh, when there were no one willing to trade for him or or, or whatever. But I think there's an interesting debate here. What's a better fit for the New England Patriots, Andy Dalton or Cam Newton, who's also still available? Neither. (laughs) I'm going to shock a few people when I say that. But quarterback is the one position in the NFL for the first time in quite some time, you got a surplus of starting quarterback. Cam is going to have to take a backup deal. So is Andy Dalton. I'm telling you, New England feels very comfortable with Stidham to sit pat 
through the draft and not have done anything. So I'm going to say one of those two guys is going to have to take a backup role somewhere, kind of like Jameis Winston has. But I don't foresee either one of those guys being able to step in the New England system and being able to play the way. They want quick thinkers, people to get the ball out of their hand quick. But more than anything, they want people that they can handpick to kind of choose to kind of show how they want them to play that position in the NFL. Well, the answer is Cam Newton, um, and you really don't have to think about it that much. Uh, and this is no shot at Andy Dalton, who's a very good quarterback in our league. Despite his playoffs woes and not being able to get over that hump, still put up consistent winning, even in Cincinnati. And some would say with a breath of fresh air or a change of scenery, you may even get more out of him. But just think, use your imagination in terms of, is there a limit for Andy Dalton? And most people will say, yeah, it feels like there is a ceiling to Andy Dalton. But then when you think about Cam Newton, if he comes back with a clean bill of health and can just stay healthy, which every single player is asked to in the NFL, stay healthy. Where does your imagination go when it comes to Cam Newton? Sky's the limit. You don't even have a ceiling in terms of what he can't do. He had his second best year last year before injury. And his best year, obviously, was an MVP year. So for all the people who say it's so... His good football so far behind him. No, it's not. It was in 2018 we saw Cam Newton looking great. So the point is, if you really want to take a, a shot, if you really want to take a flyer on one of these guys, you got to go with the one with the endless potential still, and that's Cam Newton. Listen, uh, by default, I want to say Andy Dalton, and it's really for the reasons uh, Brian mentioned in terms of New England is an offense. Get the ball out of your hands quick and on time, and where it's supposed to be. That's not Cam Newton. The ball doesn't come out on time. His footwork and his mechanics a lot of times is bad. It doesn't come out quick. And so Cam Newton, the sky's the limit, you're right, if he's healthy and in the right offensive system. Brian, I just don't believe the system in New England uh, is built for a Cam Newton, and that's why I think Andy Dalton would be a better fit of the two. Andy Dalton would be a better fit of the two if they did it, but I don't foresee either one of them going to New England because, you know, they want to they want to draft a guy, they want to groom a guy, they want to bring him along, they want to do it the Patriot way. And when you bring veteran quarterbacks in there that don't have experience in the New England system, I think he could set things awry for those guys. You know, New England has a DNA and they believe in their system, and so they must be quite comfortable that Stidham or Hoyer, one of them will be able to do the Stidham, uh, do the system, excuse me. If you remember when Tom Brady got hurt a few years back, they brought Matt Castle in, and he was the guy that they had groomed, and he played, and he had got a big payday to go to Kansas City. So they like to bring guys in. I could see them trying to go back and maybe get Jacoby Brissett or somebody that has ties in New England, but they won't bring an outside in at the quarterback. That position is too important for them. Well, look, you talk about New England system, it's going to change. Uh, we think about New England as always having this stagnant system because they had the same quarterback for 20 years. And even Bill Belichick said, when I had the opportunities to put other guys in when I was forced to, guess what they did? They changed their system. Tweaks here, tweaks there. You get a Cam Newton, J Bill Belichick and his genius, who used to run a two-man front in the playoffs, you think he's not going to change because he now has a different quarterback? Oh, no, he's Brady. Give him Brady's plays because he can only do what Brady does. Come on, y'all. This is Bill Belichick. He's pliable. Y'all crazy. I, uh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Belichick will adjust. That's what he does. Come on, y'all. Not going to happen. Hey. All right, let's keep it rolling. <laughs> okay. You have to understand. We're going to keep they it rolling. We're going to move it. Oh, let's keep it rolling. Yeah, Let's keep it rolling. We're going to move to Baltimore. Adam Shine, the radio host, had uh, Eric DaCosta, the general manager for the Baltimore Ravens, on and asked him specifically about Baltimore perhaps having an interest in Antonio Brown. DaCosta did not bring up Antonio Brown's name specifically, but he did say, like Ozzie Newsom, we're always evaluating players that are out there and available. He did, he did not dismiss the possibility of A.B. joining the Baltimore Ravens. It's kind of interesting. I'm not big on signing Antonio Brown. I think he's too much of an off-field headache. 
But I think Baltimore is the one place where the culture would be strong enough to handle A.B. because the guys in that locker room are so committed to Lamar Jackson that if if A.B. brought any nonsense to the quarterback or tried to disrupt that offense in any way, those guys would shut A.B. down very quickly. Do you think Antonio Brown would be a good fit in Baltimore, Brian? No, I don't. And I'm with you. The off-field thing would concern me. They don't have a strong personality like Ray Lewis in their locker room to be the dominant alpha male right now to shut things down if Antonio Brown went there. I think it's smart that you go out and say, you know, I'm not going to say no to anything. Uh, I think you go through and you vet everything. But at the end of the day, you were in the AFC championship game last year. I think bringing somebody in that could blow that whole thing up from a selfish standpoint, from the off the field standpoint, I don't think you want to tank your team with that that thing. And that's not saying anything about Antonio Brown off the field stuff. I don't really know what happened, but just the departures from the Raiders, how it went with New England, just those things in the last year would be of grave concern to me. And I wouldn't want to stake my franchise on bringing a guy like that in. Agree with you, Brian, right there. As much as I go back and forth with this one, I would have to land on he's a bad fit for the Ravens. This is a 14-win team that underachieved. You rarely get to say that, but they actually underachieved. And we know that when they're talking about their potential, they can't do anything risky to abandon where they are in terms of the progress and how close this team is. And you bring in an A.B., let's just be real. He may detonate at any time and blow up the entire situation. And you can't take that risk. Yeah, it's a great culture. He even has family on the team. You know he will buy into the Ravens' way in the beginning. But in adversity, no one can trust Antonio Brown. And there would be adversity because Lamar Jackson, as great as he is, and you know I'm his biggest cheerleader, struggles throwing the football down the field, outside the numbers. Matter of fact, second worst in the NFL in terms of those completions outside the numbers down the field. So that's going to be a problem if you're talking about a sweet spot for Antonio Brown on the field. I just think there's too many question marks to blow up a team that is this close. By trying to gain something on the field, you may lose it all in that locker room. Listen... Ray Lewis is never going to walk back in that locker room, and I think that's an unrealistic standard what Ray and Ed Reed set there in terms of culture. But that overall culture in Baltimore, and, and there are some individuals, I think Mark Ingram's a hell of a leader in that locker room. I think Marlon Humphrey. I think Earl Thomas III. They just added Calais Campbell. I think the overall culture in Baltimore and just the belief that everyone in that organization, from the popcorn sellers to all the way to the front office and ownership, the belief in Lamar Jackson, I do believe this is one. And, and look, John Harbaugh, other than uh, Bill Belichick and Mike Tomlin, I think the most tenured coach in the NFL. This is the one place where I think they could collectively put some discipline on, on Antonio Brown. And if it doesn't work out, they just move on from Antonio Brown. Uh, and, and because you're right, they have a great, talented team. But A.B. out there, sitting out there as a threat in the passing game, even if Lamar Jackson's not great at getting him the ball, just as a threat, it scares the hell out of safeties, in my opinion, and makes Lamar Jackson and Mark Ingram even more effective runners. I, I don't disagree with that, but, you know, for me, I don't think you take that chance to blow your team up because they have great professionals, they got guys in that locker room that go in and do their job, stay out of trouble, good people in the community, but they don't have that alpha male. And for a personality like that, he can wreck so much, he could do so much damage <clears throat> to an organization, you know, with off the field stuff. I mean, I, I don't I don't know his issues, but you know, you don't want to bring that into a young locker room, especially when in 14 games and being a game shot being in the Super Bowl. All right, let's move on to one last topic that's a little bit lighter. Uh, I, I don't think we're going to have much disagreement here, but, Brian, you, you go first here. Uh, someone has written, I think, in the Orlando Sentinel that Dan Marino should unretire his jersey so that Tua Tungviola, uh could wear it. 
And I think if they bring the number 13 out of retirement, they're going to have to do it in two places. The Dolphins and the Miami Heat, who Marino never played for, would both have to unretire the number 13. I mm. think this is crazy. Uh, Brian, what say you? Should Dan Marino unretire his jersey for touchdown two? Absolutely not. No way. Let me tell you something. For all that Dan has meant for the Miami area, having not won a Super Bowl championship, the best quarterback I ever laid my eyes on in my lifetime, other than maybe John Elway, is one, two. It's one of those two. I don't think it's newer than any of the new age guys. Uh, for me, I don't think you unretire his jersey. He has a statue of himself in front of the stadium, and that city is Dan Marino. I don't think you do that. For a guy that you ever seen take one snap. No, no. No. I'm saying the <laughs> <of> Exactly. <laughs> hey, I got more for you. No, no. Hell no. Hell no. Hell no. Like, the problem, we are, we are losing sight of the definition of retired. Like, don't let Gronkowski and all these guys fool you on what retirement really means. It means you're done. 40 years at the post office. I'm done. I'm not going back to work. When you put a jersey up in the rafters, there shouldn't be a ladder high enough to climb back up there and get the damn thing. It's retired for a reason. You got all these other numbers to choose from, and I'm sorry that your heart is attached to a number, but it can't be attached to it in this city, in this organization. So I'm not making it personal. It's not about if Marino is that great or not. It's not about if two is going to be great or not. It's about the fact that one day you told Dan Marino that his jersey would never be worn again. How could you ever fathom going back against that? So, hell no. Nah. Leave it up there. And that's for every jersey that's ever been retired. It's over. This would be the same as Vontez Burfick signing with the Dolphin. Yeah, I would let him wear number 51. Actually, I would, I, let, me, let me take that back. I would let Vontez Burfitt wear number 51. <laughs> let him get it. All right. Thank you, Brian. Appreciate, Appreciate it. it Thank you, we got to keep it rolling. Jim Jackson's going to join us just around the corner. Kendall Jenner and Devin Booker took a road trip. Some people are upset. <laughs> Darnell's question <laughs> of the day. Speak for yourself from the career presented by Hyundai. Or after this. Yes, sir. Appreciate it. My question, question, question of the day. Welcome back to Speak for Yourself. From the career, presented by Hyundai, Jason Whitlock, Marcellus Wiley, on the day before Friday. All right, we're going to roll out to Jim Jackson's crib and to our man Darnell Smith's crib for Darnell's question of the day. Darnell, yay, Jim, yay. Darnell, take it away. Yes, sir. Let's talk Kendall Jenner who apparently got bored being stuck at home during the stay-at-home order here in California. TMZ got footage of her hitting the road with NBA star Devin Booker, taking a seven-hour road trip from L.A. to Sedona, Arizona. I know a few guys around the league probably have an issue with this, and not just because of the coronavirus. Kendall has reportedly hmm. dated a bunch of NBA stars, including Ben Simmons, D'Angelo Russell, Cal Kuzma, and Blake Griffin. So I want to ask you guys, do you have a problem with Kendall and Devin Booker doing this? No, and I'd love to be coming off this bench right here. Uh, <laughs> you are late dumb. Game. It's it's stupid, man. Some quality role, player minutes. <laughs> I'll, I'll do. I'll do with anything I can to join that team. I just keep it real. I don't have a problem with any of this. <laughs> yeah, hey, hey, if you put Whitlock on that team, you're like one of these things is not the same. And it be Whitlock just sitting there, but give me a shot, girl. Look, here's my shot. Look, I have no problem with this at all. Uh, look, the younger me, the NFL version of me, I would have been rolling the dice here and there, taking calculated risks. I'm just keeping it 100. I know how our mindset is at that time, and then how you think you're invincible and. Look, I don't even think they were doing anything terribly wrong in terms of uh, putting themselves in danger or putting other people in danger. So this is just an, another case of you're going to get a ticket for driving while famous. Uh, we're going to make a bigger story of this just because you're famous, being real. And those roads weren't empty. Like, if you've been outside right now, the roads aren't empty. Someone took the damn pictures and videos. So guess what? They're out there as well. So this is a situation where, hey, we're going to make a little story out of somebody that's famous and try and go out there and cloud chase. No issue. 
Uh, hey, man, y- y'all two are funny, man. A um, couple things. A, I don't care, <laughs> okay? B, three, <laughs> things are un- three things are undefeated. Death, taxes, and women, all right? That remember you. <laughs> C, refer back to A. <laughs> because, listen, listen, to your point, young in the NBA, money, whatever it is. Now, she has... If look at the people on the list. You, you said Russell, Simmons, uh, Kuzma, now Booker, uh, Blake Griffin. What, what all, they all got something in common besides being the NBA. You know what that is? They like me. They My like skin. He, he likes skin, so she got me. <laughs> <laughs> so, Jay, you, like need to, you need to take a shot because you could hit her with the intellectual side of other things that she may not be getting from the guys that we saw over there. So, listen, you can't score if you don't shoot, homeboy. You, you got to figure it out. D- g- jump in the DM real quick. <laughs> Jim. Jim, I'm a the, little bit surprised your name ain't on that list. She could use a veteran know. presence on that team. I, I, I mean, I'm 50. <laughs> I'm 50. That's, that's way, nah, bro. Uh-uh. Nah, I'm good. <laughs> no, <laughs> that ain't Jim. Right. That ain't me. Hey, that's a player coach. You would be Bill Russell to her. You'd be a player coach to her. She's like, what the hell is this old man trying to do? But here's the thing, Jim. Hey, let me, let me, let me put, let me tell y'all why this story really has legs. And look, my gossiping ass over here about to break this down, but let me do it. Um, so it's a coronavirus right now, pandemic. You ain't supposed to be in these streets. And then mysteriously on an eight-hour road trip, we got my man Devin Booker with Kendall Jenner, who Kendall used to date. Oh, we saw the list, but she used to date Ben Simmons, and he used to date Jordan Woods. Why is that important, they say? Because they used to double date. Now, mm-hmm. all of a sudden, uh, the double date breaks up, and now the two people who weren't together are now together on an eight-hour road trip. So if y'all really want to know why people are taking some curiosity to this. They looking at a switcheroo potentially. Everybody going to say they're friends and that and that. I don't know what was happening. I'm not in that car. I'm not the driver. And if I was the driver, I would open the door for Devin Booker. How dare you get your tip and you don't even open the door for this man. But the point is, <laughs> there's a little bit of smoke in this one because it's like, oh, you were my boy and you with your girl. Y'all break up and now all of a sudden... We taking road trips together? I'm just saying. I'm hey, out. Hey, At that dinner, you know, some eye contact going on across the table with things, you know, <laughs> if, if Ben and kind of get into an argument a little bit, the book was like, <laughs> across the table. Don't worry, you know what? Don't be- nah, hey. I've been here before. Life- He's that shoulder Jay- you can cry on. <laughs> That's right. You have a lifestyle like this. Like, <laughs> would have got money to have houses in different places. I know people that here in L.A. have a house in Ojai, Santa Barbara, for the weekend they take a trip up just to break up out the city. So I get that part. But when you're a celebrity, you got to understand something. It's a camera everywhere. There's no way you everywhere. cannot go that you're not, especially in Phoenix with Devin, that you not go get caught on some kind of tape. So you're asking for it. I, yeah. We just heard the expert opinion of Jim Jackson. I don't need to go into Jim's <laughs> resume and credentials. You all know it. Tony Braxton, Jason Kidd. All right, we got to go to break here. Uh, oh, that's cold, boy. <laughs> when we come boy. back, LeVar go, Arrington's going to join us. And we're going to talk about the Patriots mm. kicker. The most fearless discussion of the day. Speak for yourself from the crib, presented by Hyundai. More after this. Yeah. Welcome back to Speak for Yourself from the Crib, presented by Hyundai. Jason Whitlock, Marcellus Wiley. It's the day before Friday. All right, let's keep it rolling. We're going to roll out to LeVar Arrington's crib in Pasadena. And we're going to talk about Patriots' uh, new kicker, uh, recent draft pick, Justin Rohrwasser, who's been involved in a social media uh, media controversy about his 3 percenter tattoo on his left arm. Uh, he is vowed to have the tattoo removed after taking heat. Uh, the group has been... Uh, in my view, uh, wrongly accused of being a racist group. Uh, It's a conservative group that supports the military. But anyway, uh, he's been accused of being a racist by Jamel Hill. Bomani Jones on the undefeated wrote a piece uh, wondering why everybody in the NFL isn't questioning this and why isn't Bill Belichick being asked more questions. 
Well, uh, on Mass Live uh, yesterday, a story came out quoting two of his former teammates, <clears throat> black teammates at Marshall, defending him, one of them saying four players, especially black players on the team, to stick up for him in this time is the perfect thing to do. He's not racist, not even close. All right, does this end the controversy? Marcel, let's get us rolling. No. Unfortunately, this doesn't end it. Uh, calling in your black friends to testify on behalf of your character is not going to be enough to extinguish this fire. If you think about it, most indiscretions, let's just be real, the person committing those indiscretions are doing everything in their power to hide them. So if you ever watch the local news, it's a story out of Pacoima, murder next door, and then... Oh, my God, you show it. It's the yellow tape around the house. And then there's a neighbor always getting interviewed right next door saying, you know what? I knew the family for 20 years and my kids used to play together, never knew anything about it. And that's the point. I don't need to hear from your best friends on the team, even if they're black. I need to know who was best friends with your intentions. And I need to interview that person and know your intentions, which is impossible so now we're going to go back to basically square one in this situation. And I agree with you, Jason. I don't think that this group should be deemed a racist group. So in that situation, it's still going to have some legs for the race baiters out there or the people who say, hey, you got a little too close for comfort in terms of the race discussion. But for me, I'm not trying to hear validations or verifications from other people. And it's, a, it's always a joke in racist conversations that the person accused of being racist always grabs the, the black person and say, no, see, here's my friends. And then you show the quantity of that and it becomes an issue. So for me, I, I, I don't need any more interviews. I, I don't think the kid should be persecuted for this. He's going to remove it. We just going to have to deal with that story and move forward. Yeah, when I when I look at the situation, it's not over. The controversy is not over because it was conjured up to, it was intended for a bigger conversation to take place and, and reset the table. Um, you gave two sources, uh, Witt and Bomani and Jamel uh, Hill. Listen, when you look at, at what this kid represents, he, he went to a small school, he plays a position nobody cares about. He would, he would not be relevant under any other circumstances other than somebody seeing and looking for something to be able to use as, as a leverage tool. This is a passive aggressive approach to be able to open up the conversation and continue the conversation surrounding how social justice issues are viewed and looked at by the National Football League. So it can't be over because the agenda is not about persecuting this young man. The agenda is about trying to continue to discuss issues that are bigger than a small school kicker that just got drafted. Well, at the end of the day, as someone that prides myself on being a journalist, what's happening to this kid is unfair. It's the role of the media not to be unfair to individuals. Uh, again, there's no proof that this particular group, the three percenters, who none of us had heard of until this controversy, or most of us, 99.9%, had never heard of. There's no proof the organization's racist. The, the, the group is pro-guns and pro-limited government. Uh, th that's been pretty clear. And so for Jamel Hill, Bomani Jones, or anybody else who has no other credibility, no other traction other than unfairly tarnishing people with charges of racism, yeah, maybe they won't let it go, but it should end. And I do think uh, the conversation and the remarks from his teammates, I do think they are valid. When people besmirch your character other, in any way, you call in character witnesses. And, you, and the, the words of people that actually have played with this young man is more valid than Jamel Hill on a Twitter feed or Bomani Jones firing off an irresponsible column on the undefeated. The words of the people that actually have interacted with him, because trust me on this, if they ever ask me about some of my Ball State teammates and if there's some of they, oh, is this guy questionable along racial lines? Oh, I'm going to be able to identify which one. Yeah, that dude's a little shady. I don't know. Oh, and I'm not going to say anything in total support of somebody that I think is a little shady. So if the people that are interacting with this kid on a daily basis in a locker room environment, in a team environment, are willing to stand up and attach their names, 
It does carry away from me. This should end. This whole thing is unfair. It's been irresponsible from day one. There's no proof the organization's racist. There's no proof this kid's racist. We all have biases, all of us, black, white, green, yellow, whatever. We all have biases, all of us. And to sit there and act like some, there's one group that has the biases and only their biases matter, I have them. We, I, as I talked about this earlier, first in line at the Million Man March. Used to go to Savior's Day in Chicago and support Louis Farrakhan when I was this kid's age. I get it. I had some biases. But it, was I racist? Could, would any of my teammates say that I was a racist person? No. But I got Farrakhan tapes delivered to me on a monthly basis when I was at Ball State University. What's happened to this kid is unfair, and it should be over based on the testimony of his teammates and just based on common sense. If people weren't out here desperate because they lost their TV shows and this is the only way they can get traction is by smearing innocent, a, a kid for nothing. If this is the only way they can get traction, have at it. If that's how you collect a check and keep yourself relevant, have at it. But it's some straight-up bull Stuff. Bull, bull what? I'm sorry. Bull, I, I, let bull, me stop. Bull what? Whoa. Oh, okay. You're bullshit. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> hey, <laughs> you, 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 you spoke. Hey, first of all, Wusa, I get it. Uh, I'm with you. Hey. You spoke a lot of truth right there, big dog. But with that said, you didn't speak fully to this question. And I'm speaking to this question. Will it end the controversy? No. Um, you spoke Should of something that is factual. Yeah, and it won't. And you know why? As LeVar was saying, it, there's a greater conversation, and all it's doing is looking for anything to gobble up to, to give it ammunition fuel for the conversation at large. In, in part, that's where our media is, and in part, unfortunately, that's where our minds, in terms of attention span, is as a consumer. It's sad to see, but let's be real. Most people are not into content as much as they're into headlines. And I mm. think the sensationalism that is occurring is as long as I can get this spark, this electric charge, this third rail off of this conversation, I don't give a damn who I light up in the process. And this kid's going to get lit up in the process. But is the kid sitting there in, in fulfillment of what racist looks like? I don't see it. But that's not the conversation, and that's not the controversy, and that's why this will continue, unfortunately, even beyond today. Yeah, I think the controversy is, is inaccurately placed. It's, it's being placed on the kid, and whether it's fair or not, that life is not fair. And, and a lot of people have to deal with the unfair uh, circumstances that surround some of the decisions that they make. He made the decision. It made him a target. Somebody's using him as leverage, and that's all this is, is leverage to keep yeah. the agenda yeah. of the conversation moving forward, all right? You say, okay, is this kid worth, worth you know, getting rid of or what, what happens to him? The controversy is not connected to him. It's connected to the issue of social justice conversations, and we all know it, and whether we want to be outright about it or not, the this next conversation that's going to come— justice. Oh, well, but, but people are going to this make it This has nothing to do with social justice. justice. I'm sorry, LeVar, we got to wrap it up. Th yeah, this has yeah. to do with politics. This has to do with strict politics. And we've moved in this country where if you're <laughs> conservative, we can smear you with racism. And that's just bogus BS. Just because someone's conservative, just because they're pro-guns, just because they're uh, for limited government, doesn't make them racist. And that's all this is, is a political deal of trying to force this kid and other young people, if you're a conservative, you need to be ashamed of it. You must be progressive and liberal. You must believe what we believe. It's the ultimate form of fascism and supremacy. It's the ultimate form of mind control. It happens with Justin Rohrwasser. It happens with Kanye West. It happens with me. And I'm not even involved in politics. I don't get involved with politics. But if you don't think what a certain group thinks you should think, they will smear your character and go after you in the most unfair fashion possible. I don't, care. I don't know who the three percenters are. They have no control over my life. They have no influence over my life. We should leave it alone. The controversy has been, I got to go.